This is In Hindsight, Half a Century of Research Discoveries in Canadian History, presented by Dr. Donald B. Smith and produced by the Ontario Historical Society. Today we're going to be doing something a little different. We're staying with the Mississauga in this episode. In fact, this is one of the four Mississauga episodes, and we're certainly with that same subject. But this is a little different because, well, we're going to be doing two things. I'm going to introduce you more fully to the Mississauga, which the Anishinaabe people in the North Shore of Lake Ontario, they were called Mississauga by the settlers. I'm going to do a little bit of that, more introduction to the First Nation. And then I'm going to tell you about a really extraordinarily bizarre individual who actually was involved in a nasty skirmish, a gruesome incident with the Mississauga, and then afterwards became their champion. In fact, his work in the 1790s, um, his the petition that he sent to the government is actually quite accurate, although his background was particularly gruesome. So he's he's a, a, a still a, quite a mysterious character, but he surfaces enough that we can describe him. And his name was David Ramsey. He was a Scot. But before we come to him, I'd like to just do some more back, give some more background on the Mississauga, because in our first Mississauga episode on Peter and Eliza, that wasn't delved, dealt with it as deeply as I I. I it, it should be. And so we'll do that today in the second episode and uh, then introduce this unsavory character, David Ramsey. Well, who are the Mississauga? Let's clear that up. They are Anishinaabe. And I'm sorry, there's quite a few names here. So just hang tight and I'll try to simplify it. The Mississauga are Anishinaabe. That is the people's name for themselves. In English, we used to, well, quite frequently, the preferred term was Ojibwe. Ojibwe, and then that's how it was pronounced in British North America. The Americans preferred, by and large, Chippewa. It's just Ojibwa and Chippewa. It's just a different sound for the same word. Um, But the First Nations, and rightly so, they call themselves Anishinaabe, which means human beings and whatnot. And, And it's their own name for themselves. And that's course, the usage now. But in the historical literature, we have this other term, Ojibwe or Chippewa, and we have also Mississauga. Who are they? Well, I've suggested this already, but um, it's, it's a bit complicated. The Mississauga are the Ojibwe or Chippewa on the North Shore of Lake Ontario, or the Anishinaabe on the North Shore of Lake Ontario. There's not; They're not separate. They're, they're, it's just a settler's name. It's a, it's a, it, there are, there's that's certainly the interpretation that I follow. So it, it's just complex. And let's not worry about the terminology just now. Just to, just accept for the purposes of the episode and the purposes of the series, the Mississauga are the Anishinaabe on the North Shore of Lake Ontario. This is the term that was used in the 18th and 19th centuries and is embedded now. But they're Anishinaabe. It's the same there's nothing separate. The Anishinaabe and the Mississauga are the same people, like Ontarians and Canadians. It's the same thing. So that is basically what is going on with the name. The Anish, they, the line of the language is, like when I was beginning my study of this group, uh, Ojibwe was the term that was always used because that was the language. That was the way they described the language. But Anishinaabe be Bimowin is actually their name for their own language. So that is another new term. Well, not two terms of the First Nations. It's the one they've always used. But they're also the name of the language then. We have a, this other term. Well, who are they? Well, f- they are, <laughs> again, I told you terminology is complex, and that's why we're spending a little extra time on it. The two great distinctions in Eastern North America, uh, the the, the linguists made, were between the Algonquians and the Iroquoians. So let's introduce, we have to do language groups here. The Algonquians 
they the Algonquian speakers are extent, extensive language family, which extends extends all the way from the Maritimes to Alberta. The Mi'kmaq belong to the Algonquian group, the Ojibwe, the Cree, the Blackfoot, even in where I'm living in Alberta. They are all members of the Algonquian linguistic family. So let's make that quite clear. In northeastern North America, the other group, uh, linguistic family, which is very, very prominent and expanded over the area, are the Iroquoians. So we have two terms, Algonquian and Iroquoian. The Anishinaabeg, hence the Ojibwe, the Mississauga, and the Chippewa, all these other terms, same terms for them, different terms, but same people, they are Algonquians. Now, in this Algonquian group, the Anishinaabeg being only one group, there are within the Anishinaabeg dialects. So it, it, it is it's somewhat complex. For the purposes of this episode, I'm just going to use the term Ojibwe and Mississauga. We'll leave the others aside and but please recognize that the name of the language is not Ojibwe to the First Nations themselves. It's on uh, Anishinaabe Bimowin. That is actually the term. But for us today, just Mississauga and Ojibwe. Let's go. The Ojibwe or Anishinaabe in southern Ontario came from the north. They came down uh, about 300 years ago, 400 years ago now about 1700. They came from the Lake Superior area and their tradition is that they were victorious over the Iroquoians or Iroquois or <laughs> Haudenosaunee. I'm sorry, Iroquois have their own name, of course, for themselves. People of the Longhouse, that's what they call themselves, the Haudenosaunee. And the argument is that the Anishinaabe defeated the Haudenosaunee, and that's how they came to occupy southern Ontario. And this took place around 1700. They were present here when the British came, and the treaties are made with the Anishinaabe, or on the north shore of Lake Ontario with the Mississauga. They are the treaty people. This Haudenosaunee, or Iroquois, their interpretation, though, was they were not defeated. They simply withdrew. When they just before 1700, so there's a all this. It's very controversial. So there's two opinions on this. But the fact is that when the British came in the 18th century, when Upper Canada was formed in the late 18th century, Governor James uh, John J. Graves Simcoe was the first governor. When, at that time period, the Mississauga were present. The treaties were made with them not with the Haudenosaunee, not with, or, or Iroquois. The treaties were with the Mississauga. They are the treaty people. What way of life, what was their way of life like? Let's just perhaps put a little cultural aspect in this. In the 18th century, the seasonal way of life was the traditional one. The people were primarily hunters and fishers with a little bit of a little bit of horticulture. There was some planting of corn, but basically they're hunters and fishers, these Anishinaabe in the North Shore of Lake Ontario. And their way of life was seasonal. Their four seasons, their own names for them were as follows. Baboon, which is winter. That translates as freezing weather. Spring, Seguin. And that, of course, is the sap season. And that ended and summer began or spring began when especially very, very attaching Iroquois phrase or, or Haudenosaunee phrase, spring began when the white oak leaves had reached the size of a red squirrel's foot. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> that's, that's Haudenosaunee though. It's not Mississauga, but nevertheless, it just tells you a lot. So we have then baboon, winter, seguin, spring, and then summer, the abundant season. That's Nibing. And finally, Teguiglin, the fading season or the fall. So this was a, a seasonal round of activities and uh, 
that's what this in contrast to the Haudenosaunee or Iroquoians, they are not in a, all year round in a settled village situation at all. They are migratory in the sense that they, they, they have a, a round around their, tradi- a, a, around their traditional territory in those four seasons. The world of the Mississauga or Anishinaabeg was full of totally different. I mean, it's it's such an injustice to try and summarize in five minutes. But all I want to do in this episode is give you an idea of the complexity of it. And the this this is their religious system, their worldview. All of this is very complex. There's they had in their outlook, their understanding of the world, everything was living, and. All things had power, and you must be in good terms. You cannot, um, in any way, offend these 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 entities, animals, even physical uh, structures. They had a, a spirit. There was there was something that had to be observed. Otherwise, it just it, it, the whole world would come out of out of kil- kilter. Their world was populated also by very by beings that other world beings that uh, deserve to be understood. And again, this is quite atrocious. I, I first to apologize. Indigenous studies people are they, we need them badly at this point because this is a very complex culture and it has to be understood understood culturally and linguistically and uh, whatnot. So, but it really something must be said. So I'll continue. In their world, there were several characters and entities that are must be introduced. There was Mishibishu, the great lynx or cat, a huge water cat, and this was a this individual, this Mishibishu. That was it was the enemy of the thunderbirds. Um, the thunderbirds in the, in the skies waged perpetual war against the Mishibishu, and for example, when thunder was that was the that was the noise made by the wings of the thunderbirds, um, and lightning was when they shot arrows against Mishibishu. More benign were the elves, the mamma. Wiziswag, and they were quite friendly. They were, but they'd been spotted. They were like they were elves, and uh, they didn't really cause much trouble to humans. But they, they were certainly on the scene too. They'd been seen. The worst, uh, from human point of view, the worst of these entities was the Wendigo. This was a, a monster who took human form, and its faces, the faces of the Wendigos were covered with hair. They were absolute, uh, they were a menace, and uh, so one had to be aware of them. One had to be constantly aware, and also not to abuse the spirits of the animals, of the physical entities. and So it's a different cosmology, it's a different world totally. And that's just the beginning to our discussion now of this strange character who comes into the picture and is, we're going to discuss him. In the 1790s, first decade of the 19th century as well, and well into the 19th century, it seemed as if the Wendigos were dominant in the Mississauga world. I say that because so many things were going wrong for the First Nations. These were difficult, difficult times for the Mississauga. That is, the Anishinaabeg and the North Shore of Lake Ontario. The late 18th century to the early 19th century were particularly horrific. The intrusion of non-Indigenous settlers, the entry of disease, the divisions between the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe were also a contributing factor. It was at this moment of acute weakness that the British entered, opposed treaties, and another challenge for the Mississauga, they don't understand. Their whole system, their whole society is not based on private land ownership. It's totally different. Their whole cosmology is different. Their whole understanding of the world. And suddenly, in a couple of seconds, well, not seconds perhaps, but days, 
the treaties and how to what what do they mean? And the Mississauga believed and this is pretty common throughout North America that these were uh, agreements to share the land. The British side wasn't that at all. These were outright surrenders, and the occupants became tenants. This is it's it's huge, and we'll come back to this in other episodes. It's I'm just introducing it here. In this situation, this dire situation, and one which is very well described, I liked very much the description, uh, the description Deanna Reader provided in her new book, Autobiography as Indigenous Intellectual Tradition, a book which just came out this year, or last year now. Uh, Deanna teaches English and Indigenous Studies at Simon Fraser University in British Columbia. In her new book, she makes this summary, which I thought was very, very helpful. It was... So difficult for the Mississauga. Was George Copway, actually, is the writer that she's referring to. And it was so difficult because they were living in such a dangerous moment. And then she begins. Previous indigenous economic and governance systems were undermined by the encroachment of settlers and their usurping of land. Food systems were failing. Good description, good tight description of the situation the Mississauga found themselves in. Now, we've looked at quickly, and again, I want to insist, this is very complex. I am not, a, I took the Ojibwe, I studied Ojibwe, Anishinaabe, I took it for two winters, once at the Native, uh, Toronto Native Friendship Centre, true, but that was 50 years ago, and I, the culture is so challenging. I can't claim to have any deep expertise. So this is all very tentative. I provided that sketch and I made it quite clear. Indigenous studies people are who you have to go to them, the Anishinaabe scholars, to understand the culture. But I, I did that just to introduce you to the complexities and the differences that are involved. In this situation of cultural confusion and extreme and dire situation for, from the point of view of the First Nations in, in this Great Lakes area, in the Southern Great Lakes, in this situation, there's this individual I want to talk about and end the episode with. He's a strange character, very bizarre. And his name is David Ramsey. He was a Scot. And he, had, he was a sailor who become a fur trader. And he's so important to us because he writes down the complaints of the Mississauga. This is extraordinary. There's no contact between the two groups. There really isn't. There's no, uh, the, well, some of the Anishinaabe speak a little English, but not too much. There's no schools. There's no, there's contact with traders, but there's no incentive on the trader's part to educate the First Nations so they understand <laughs> really what the process is. No, they, they just they, they lack English. They don't have English. And heavens, on the settler side, they don't have the Ojibwe language. They, the communication is so limited. It's really restricted to a couple of traders on the, on the non-native side. And one of those individuals was David Ramsey. So this character had actually, 20 years before he prepared this memo on the Mississauga's complaints, which the memo was 1793. I found it 50 years ago. Kitchen Hunt. Wayne was 49. You know, this is, a, this is the difficulty of being a historian. You always have to be right with your dates. But let's just make it safe and say around 50 years ago, it was certainly at the beginning. It was when I was still in Ontario before I moved to Alberta, which was 1974, I found this document in the Simcoe Papers, and it's the memoir, uh, the, uh, well, it's a, really a summary uh, made by David Ramsey, and he hardly, his English was pretty primitive. It's a, it this awkward English memorial to Governor Simcoe explaining the Mississauga situation, 1793. And it's, it's, it's really unique because there's nothing else. And I'm going to tell you a little more about David Ramsey. But at this point, let's just have him sending in this dispatch to the governor. And uh, he really tells it like it is. Petition states, and it's reporting the Mississauga's opinion. The newcomers intrude, quote, on our hunting ground, which is our farm. At the first, at their fisheries and in the settlements, quote, when white peoples see anything that they like, 
They never quit us until they have it. The taking or stealing from us is nothing, for we are only Mississaugos. Well, it's David Ramsey, a Scot. He has a really quite a background, and we know about him because he was entrusted uh, by the settlers to carry, um, well, couriers, couriers from uh, Upper Canada to New York. He would he'd be he's a trusted individual. And, uh, well, let's find out more about him. You know, in history, <laughs> it's great to have the quote, it's great to have the statement made, but who's the, who's the recorder? Who's, the, who's, who's making that? Who's, who's the source? Then we have to know the source. We do this right throughout the, all every episode. I want to know my sources before I can give them the information with any confidence. Who was David Ramsey? Well, he had he was a Scot. He enlisted as a ship's boy in the Royal Navy in late 1750s, and he'd actually served just as a, a boy in, the, in well, as a sort of cabin boy situation. He had been at Louisbourg. He'd been at um, the Siege of Quebec in 1759. So he knew he's a pretty tough got a pretty tough background, this naval background. He was well exposed to the hardships of the sailor in the mid-19th century, the overcrowding, the scurvy, the squalor, the drink and brawling common in the Navy. So he's a pretty hard character. Hard. And in 1763, he was posted to a British patrol vessel on Lake Ontario. He chose to remain in Upper Canada, or in what was to be soon Upper Canada. He stayed in the lower Great Lakes area after he left the Navy and he became a fur trader. After, uh, sorry, he left, a, he was on a British patrol vessel on Lake Ontario. And then when he uh, ret- he left the Navy, he remained in North America on, upon his discharge and he worked for a fur trader and eventually went into business on his own. This was a poorly regulated time in the 1760s the late 1760s, Britain had just defeated the French in 1760, in the early 1760s, and this is only five years or so later. It was poorly regulated. Well, Ramsey, who is now a fur trader, was arrested in 1768, just started, and uh, the commander at uh, Commandant at Fort Niagara arrested him for causing trouble, and he was sent to Montreal, where he was kept in a guardhouse for a couple of days. Well, obviously, this is not a bad start here for David Ramsey. Our introduction to him is not extremely positive. The worst incident took place three years later. Ramsey, with his younger, with his young brother, George, traveled from Schenectady, New York, to the north shore of Lake Erie. And they wintered with Anishinaabeg people, mainly for, for that winter. Exactly what happened is not clear, but Ramsey did not obviously get along with his cl- clients. He later claimed that the First Nations had repeatedly threatened to kill him if he did not give them rum on the First Nations side, because there was some testimony taken after what occurred. They said that Ramsey had been drunk and mad all winter. Now, the incident takes place in March. Pretty atrocious, too. Pretty gruesome. Ramsey killed and scalped a warrior and two women, while the rest of the band was absent. Well, the First Nations captured him, tied him to a post, but Ramsey got loose. He killed and scalped five of the party that had captured him, including a woman woman and a child. His brother and he proceeded to Fort Erie, where... Ramsey was arrested and sent to Niagara and then to Montreal. So what happens now? He has murdered, um, well, quite clearly, eight individuals. And so what's going to happen to him? But the problem is there are no witnesses. There's no non-Indigenous witnesses. So this is going to be rough. What's he going to do? What happens? That's, that's what we'll now look at. Well, Ramsey claimed he'd acted in self-defense, but the British authorities were incensed. It was clearly not so. Sir William Johnson, superintendent of Northern Indians, bitterly observed, quote, killing a woman and a child and then scalping them afterwards is inexcusable. And the circumstance of his being able to do all this is evident proof that he was not in the danger he represents and that the Indians were too much in liquor to execute any bad purpose. Well... Johnson was well aware of the ways of white juries in cases of crimes committed against Indigenous people. 
And Johnson continues, I don't think he will suffer had he killed a hundred. That's what he wrote. And Ramsey did not. He didn't suffer. He was held briefly, but he was did not have to pay for that the, that incident of those murders. Thomas Gage, British commander in chief, informed Johnson he did was doing all his all he could. I'm trying all I can to get evidence for what is related concerning his cruelty. And truly, no wretch ever deserved more of the gallows. But a Montreal's jury acquitted him for lack of evidence. During the American Revolution, the mid begins in the mid seventeen seventies, Ramsey again served in the Royal Navy. And here is the most incredible situation. After the conflict ended, he returned to live among the relatives of the Anishinaabe he had killed. The Mississauga resented his presence, but fearing British retaliation if he were harmed, they simply insisted that he pay the relatives of his victims a certain amount in goods. Well, they that that's just the surface. There still was terrific resentment against him, and some Anishinaabeg threatened revenge. In fact, there was an attempt to kill him in 1793, about the same time he did the petition. Ramsey's relationship with the Mississaugas was indeed a complex one. He told a Scottish traveler just about that. It's, his memoir survives, and we've got it. That's why I'm able to quote it. Ramsey apparently told the Scottish traveler, quote, there was no dependence to be placed in an Indian. And yet he wrote out the petition in 1793. This is very confusing. However, since the petition has the ring of truth to it, because there are Indian council minutes which indicate the Mississauga were saying the same. So, Ramsey, there's something to it. Why did he do this? Well, this is the mystery. History is full of mysteries, and we just don't have complete information. We shouldn't complain, though. We've got something. We can trace this out. There's a shape to it, but not the full details. It's very bizarre, very confusing. This Ramsey was... Oh. He, 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 he's obviously <laughs> understatement of the year, mentally unstable. He was just, he's, he's just, but yet he's, he's respected by the settlers and uh, the non-indigenous people entrust him with dispatches. Oh, very confusing. And that's how he earned his living in the 1790s. He was uh, carrying dispatches and money for people in the Niagara area. And he hastened the uh, Upper Canadian Executive Council approved his application for a land grant, 600 acres. Very strange. Well, unfortunately, I can't go into much more detail, except to introduce you to this unsavory character and this gruesome story of his eight murders, and then this strange petition. So it's just a lot of question marks. Even in Ramsey's lifetime, the story of the killings had entered local fol folklore. These occurred in the area at Long Point, at the northeastern shore of Lake Erie, Long Point. And there in that area, the early settlers remembered or had or heard versions of the story and carried it into the early 19, into the late 19th century, 100 years later. The form that story took tells us much about the attitudes towards native peoples held by early English-speaking settlers. Here's the traditional account. I'll tell it to you. And this is... He, the, the tale it's as told is that the party of Indians made an unprovoked attack on Ramsey one night at Long Point. Becoming drunk in his liquor, they decided to wait until the morning before burning him, and while they slept, Ramsey got free and killed them all. That is the distilled version, and it shows the anti-First Nations bias. Ramsey was remembered as brave for his heroic self-defense. Well, isn't this a tragedy? There is another version. Well, not another version, but there's another opinion of Ramsey. And fortunately, there was an individual, bicultural, bilingual, very articulate in English, the Mohawk chief, Joseph Brandt. Joseph Brandt, the distinguished Haudenosaunee chief, termed Ramsey a mischievous fellow and an unworthy rascal. The mystery of David Ramsey continues. An enigma. An enigma wrapped up in a mystery. Let's put it that way.
it's that's Churchill actually talking, I, as I recall, about China. But it applies here, and I hope my memory of the quote was right. But the the principle is right in that. How do we? What do we? How do we make sense of this man? But what's clear to me, what I take away from it, and to my knowledge, I'm, I've done an article. I did on. I did my my one of my first academic articles was actually a popular article. It was for the Beaver, the Canada's histories. Um, that was the former name of Canada's history, the popular history magazine. I did an article for them, 1975. And uh, so it's one of my first, it, well, it is. <laughs> it, it, it's one of the early ones. And he puzzled me then. He still puzzles me. I haven't resolved it any anymore, except what I take from it is this anti-Indigenous background of the set or attitudes of the settlers, and secondly, the uh, the fact that the First Nations, the Mississaugans, the Anishinaabeg, were just treated so miserably. And I'll come back to that. We've got more coming on that score. Thank you.